From the waters of creation, the earth sprang forth. From the waters of a womb, God's blessed Son has, was given to us. From the waters of a river, people were baptized and marked as God's children. Praise be to God, whose loving gifts and presence have called us together. Let us shout our love to God for God's abundant love. Amen. Thank you. 
the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from the Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Today we're going to learn about someone really important. His name is John the Baptist. How many of you guys have heard of John the Baptist before? Uh, Yeah. Just right now? Okay. Well, he's someone that's really important in the Bible. He was born six months before Jesus, and his job was to prepare everyone to get ready to meet Jesus because Jesus was going to be baptized and he was going to start his ministry. So I have a picture of John the Baptist. What do you notice about him? Uh, he has um, a weird cloak on his arm. Oh. Yeah, he's dressed kind of strange, right? He doesn't look like he lives in civilization. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. No, that's, that's a really good way to put it, and that's so true. Okay, Jacob? It looks like he wears a dress. Well, back then in Bible times, everybody, everybody dressed like this, sort of. They kind of had cloaks and robes. But yeah, he is dressed really unusual. He would wear camel's hair, right? Now, if you live in the desert, would you wear animal hair if it's super hot? Whoa. The, can you imagine going to, you know, walking around Hawaii when it's super hot and wearing fur? Where not only that, he ate really weird things. He ate locusts and honey. Locusts are like gigantic grasshoppers, right? They, yeah, and then honey, you know, they would find it, you know, in the desert. He would find it in the desert. And that's what he ate. But he kind of lived like this um, because he had a calling. And his calling was to tell everybody that Jesus was coming and that they had to prepare their hearts. Now, as you can imagine, do you think this was an easy life or a hard life? Finding Finding honey in the desert is pretty lucky. It is, but, you know, if you imagine eating it, just that, right? And insects, yeah, that's gross, right? So he lived a really hard life, but he did what God was calling him to do, right? And I know a lot of us might encounter a time where we knew what was right, we knew what God wants us to do, but we can either choose to listen or not listen. Can you guys share a time where you knew what the right thing to do was? It was really hard, but you did it anyway. There was this one time where I just didn't want to, I was sick of doing my Puma packets, which is like kind of like homework. So I flushed it down the toilet. And then later when I was watching TV, um, I just kept getting so guilty. And I told my, I told my mom and I started crying when I told her. I remember that you came up to me and you said, I flushed my Puma packet in the toilet. I'm so sorry. (laughs) But you knew what the right thing to do was, right? You knew that that was not right and that was dishonest. I'm just su- surprised you didn't get angry at me. I didn't get angry because I was like, wow, you did the right thing. You told the truth. Okay. So, do you have a time? Um, there was this one time in sixth or seventh grade when I had to do, we were doing this event at school and I had a, like a whole group that was supposed to work with me, but I ended up doing it alone. Wow. Did you 
yell at them, get really upset, or what did you do? After the event, we had this reflection, and I was just, like, pointing it out to them, like, very generally, because they were, like, friends. So I kind of, like, pointed it out, and they tried to, like, backlash at me, but that didn't happen. But in the end, you got the project done, yeah. and you did what you're supposed to do. That's amazing. I had to uh, be advertisement, and then it was so hard, but it was also good, because then people wrote down the windows and said, good job, bruh. Good job being advertisement or something like that. It I had a sleeve of pink blue shots, um, and then I had this turn here sign, and then I was going all crazy. And then even when they just blue shots, I was blue shots. I was still holding the pen turn here, and so and it was like three hours. So yeah, I'll share the picture. Oh, nice. <laughs> so you volunteered for three hours and made sure people got their flu shots. All right. So these are all things that were not easy, but you guys did what you kn you knew you were supposed to do. And I think that's how, how John the Baptist lived. You know, I'm sure people thought he was strange. People didn't understand why he lived the way he lived. He, just as Kara said, lived kind of outside of civilization. But that was, you know, God's calling for him. And to tell everyone that Jesus is coming, come be baptized, get your heart ready. Amen? Have you ever had one of those moments where you are experiencing something and you think, wow, this is so important, this is so big, and I probably won't know the value of this experience until later on? I've had one of those moments in the past. I remember when my dad uh, worked for a company, he was a civil engineer, and he ended up getting a couple Nets tickets. And I was in college at the time. My brother was in high school and he asked if we wanted to go to the game. And this is when the Nets were doing really well. Jason Kidd was a part of the team. And there was just this talk and this electricity in the air. People thought that finally maybe the Nets would win a championship. Well, this was uh, a game that was kind of very into the season. It was a very important game. And my dad wanted to offload these tickets that he got from his company. It was a really busy time for his company, so nobody in his company was able to go. So he asked my brother and I, and I wasn't really into basketball, and I tried to find friends uh, to give the tickets to, but it was so last minute. So my brother and I, we just said, we'll go. So we go, and the stadium was packed, and there was just so much energy and so much enthusiasm. We were trying to find our seats, but we noticed that the tickets uh, didn't, the numbers on the tickets didn't match with the, with the stadium seats. So we were trying to figure out, you know, where to sit, and we asked someone, and they looked at the tickets, and they said, oh, you guys are in the box suite. And I've never been s in a box seat ever. Like, I don't, I've never experienced that. So he showed us where to go. So we go in, and it was a really nice room. You could see the whole court, n no view obstruction. Uh, the seats were really comfortable. They were really cushy. And my brother and I, we walk in, and everybody in there is, like, middle-aged. And, you know, I'm in college, and my brother is in high school. So we look like a couple kids, but they were all smiling. They're like, welcome, come in, and welcome to the box suite, you know? So we sit down, and... There were these people with with uh, carts coming with food, and we were like, "How much is this?" And they're like, "Oh, it's free." So my brother and I we piled on, you know, plates of food, and we were just eating and having a, a good time. And uh, it was it was just interesting because I the game was so uh, riveting. It was one of the one of those games you're just on your edge, the on the edge of your seat the whole time, and it was so much fun. And at the end, we won the game. And everybody, you know, the whole stadium erupts and everybody's laughing and clapping and, you know, they're so ex excited and everyone in the suite was really excited and we were all high-fiving each other. We don't know who each other are. We don't know each other, but, you know, everybody was just so excited. And, you know, I kind of felt, wow, I'm in the middle of something really important. And I get to have a front row seat to see it. Well, later on that season, they did end up in the finals, uh, but they didn't win the championship. This was the 2002-2003 season. Um, but yeah, I, I just had that feeling. I'm not even into basketball, but wow, I am witnessing, you know, Nets history unfold right now. I, kn I know I'm watching something really important. I think that's maybe kind of what uh, John the Baptist might have felt. 
as we've been learning about John the Baptist the last few weeks, we learn that he is uh, someone who was called by God to prepare people's hearts for Christ. So he was going around and telling people to repent, to really look at how they're living their lives. And um, people from all over Galilee and Judea came in crowds and they were repenting and they were being baptized in the Jordan River, kind of symbolically saying that they want a fresh start in life and they want to be right with God. Well, in today's passage, uh, John the Baptist, he, um, he claims there is somebody coming that's more powerful than him because people had been coming to him, approaching him. You know, are you the Messiah? Who are you? And he says something interesting. He says, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and, uh, and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, Back in the day, if you were uh, a servant or a slave, you would be in charge of washing people's feet. I'm sure you remember just before Jesus died, uh, he washed his disciples' feet. And that was something that a very lowly servant or slave did because everybody walked around wearing sandals. Obviously, as you can imagine, everybody's feet was very dirty. When you walk into someone's house and you were a guest at someone's house, it was normally the lowest servant or slave that would untie the, the sandals and actually wash the feet. And what John the Baptist is saying here is, you know, when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes, and he is coming, I am not worthy to even touch his feet like a servant would or even like a slave. I'm so unworthy. And that's what John the Baptist is saying. Well, it's funny because in the next verse, right after that, uh, Jesus appears and he is baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. We see in the book of Mark his perspective of what he sees as he's baptizing Jesus. And in verse 10 it says, And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. Now, when it says heavens torn apart, that's a particular word in Greek. And if we were to fast forward to Mark chapter 15, verse 38, when the temple curtain where God's spirit supposedly dwells is torn apart in two, it's the same exact word. So here in Mark chapter 1, it says, and he saw the heavens torn apart. And then in Mark chapter 15, verse 38, the curtain uh, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. And it says the spirit descended on him like a dove. Y I know it's very common for us to equate uh, the Holy Spirit like a dove. Uh, but it's really what this is saying is the way it fell upon Jesus it was like a dove. And at this in this area, it would be very uh, common for anyone to understand what this means, w a dove that lands with uh, speed and precision and grace. So we get this picture that the spirit just, you know, intentionally with preci precision just falls upon Jesus. And then it says, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And John the Baptist gets a front row seat to all of this happening. And it's interesting because just as he said that he was unworthy, unworthy to even uh, untie the sandals of Jesus, he gets to not only baptize Jesus, but he gets to see the Trinity unfold right in front of him. You know, he hears the voice of God. He sees the Spirit descend upon Jesus. He sees the heavens torn open. And that's the confirmation that he and anyone else that was there would need to see that he is the Messiah. A few weeks ago, we looked at the John passage, the John chapter 1 passage, and there were actually many leaders that came up to John the Baptist asking him who he is. You know, so they would ask, are you Elijah uh, or are you the prophet? And that's a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18 where God said that there's going to be a prophet that will rise among the Israelites, meaning that there would be a Messiah that would come out of Israel. 
So, you know, they are asking, who are you? And John repeatedly says, I am not that person. Now, there are things that he could have said. You know, he it was a descendant of the priestly line. He was a son of Zechariah, uh, the pr a priest from the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. He was a Nazarite, someone who took the vow of, you know, growing out their hair and not drinking and just living kind of an ascetic life, dedicating their lives for their call. There's a lot of things he could have said to kind of boost his own ego and uh, to make people know that he's to be taken seriously, but he doesn't. He just completely points his life to Christ. And in the end, when he was able to witness this experience, Jesus uh, was in the Jordan River where he was already ministering. Jesus showed up in his place of ministry. And he was just being faithful in calling people to repentance. He was being faithful in living out his calling. I'm sure all of you have heard or seen and read uh everything that happened this week with the mob that stormed our Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I couldn't believe on Wednesday as I was kind of meditating and thinking about epiphany and just thinking about different passages and whatnot. And all my friends were kind of sharing some kind of devotionals. And, you know, and then I saw the news and I couldn't stop watching all these uh, video, all this video footage of people storming the Capitol and protest and one of the things I couldn't stop doing was, you know, a lot of people, as they were storming the Capitol building, they were taking video footage of themselves. You know, they were on their cell phones and almost like they were vlogging. Uh, they were recording the experience as it was unfolding. So as they were walking into the Capitol building, breaking the glass, as they were sitting a, on, you know, officials' desks, a lot of these people were recording themselves. And I could not stop watching videos of clips of these recordings. I don't recommend you do it. It's, it's very disturbing. But so basically, they were saying uh, that this was stolen from us. We were wronged. Everything that we're doing is justified because what we wanted was taken from us. What we should have gotten was taken from us. Uh, we are the victims, and they are going to pay for what they're doing. You know, and it's some variation, uh, some version of that. And another really disturbing thing was there were signs of Jesus everywhere. Jesus 2020, right? I, I could not get over how disturbing that was because everything that these people were doing was completely antithetical to everything that Jesus represents. And I really felt God telling me two things. Uh, the first thing I felt the Holy Spirit leading me uh, towards is this thought that I am worthy. You know, as John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. Uh, but I really felt God assuring me, you are worthy for your calling. You are worthy uh, to be used by God, to be serving God. Uh, and that's something that I continually struggle with. Uh, the second is, uh, for me, I really want to emulate my life uh, to be like Christ and also like John the Baptist. He never focused on himself or what he deserved or what he was owed or uh, he never wanted people to focus on his accomplishments or who he was or what he deserved. It was all about pointing his life to Christ and the life-changing grace of Christ. And that's what I want my life to be like. And again, in stark contrast to everything that unfolded and happened in our nation's capital. I really believe uh, that when we focus our lives on being faithful with what God has given us, we can be a part of God moving on earth. We could be a part of uh, watching the miracle happen. We could see change and, you know, people working together, loving one another, people being compassionate towards one another, we could see God moving on earth and heaven unfolding. When we focus only on ourselves or, or what we should have been given or how we were wronged or how we were not owed what we should have gotten, and it's entirely focused on what we, des what we think we deserve, uh, that's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to the destruction of relationships. It's going to lead to the destruction of what God wants for us and in our lives. And I couldn't help but seeing those two themes in contrast today. 
uh, the humility of John the Baptist and the faithfulness of John the Baptist and the anger, the strife, and the violence that erupted on Wednesday. And for me, you know, as I was thinking about Epiphany, as I was thinking about the light of Christ this past Wednesday, I want my life to be focused on what God is doing and to be faithful with what God has called me to do. And I hope it will be the same for you. For announcements this week, I just want to thank everybody who showed up for the work day and for taking down Christmas decorations and for all of our high virus members. Thank you so much for staying safely at home. We were certainly thinking about you. Uh, the Christmas decorations are taken down and the landscaping looks great. Thank you so much. Also, we, are, we have some changes to our virtual worship. We're going to actually have our Kiki story just before the sermon. And part of that is because I'm having some technical difficulties rendering two different um, a virtual worship and a separate Kiki story. So because of technical difficulties, we're going to hold off on the virtual Sunday school. And we are going to just have our sermon at the start of our Kiki story at the start of just before the sermon. Um, but also what I would like to do is we're going to roll out a Zoom Sunday School on Sunday. So we'll have it every other week. We're going to start January 17th. So not today, but next week uh, at 11.15. If you're Kiki, could just sign on Zoom and we'll just have a short Zoom uh, Bible study. So you don't need any materials. If you could just sign on Zoom, we'll watch a short video and have a discussion and we'll have a fun interactive Bible study session that way. Also, we're going to start our Methodist History Bible Study. That's uh, it's going to be a Methodist history class, but also a Bible study class where we're going to be talking about the history of our faith as United Methodists. And uh, it'll be a Bible study, and it also kind of goes into Lent. So uh, it'll also be kind of our Lenten Bible study as well. It's going to start January 27th, Wednesday at 7 p.m. And it's going to be two and a half sessions of British Methodism and then two and a half sessions of American Methodism. And we're going to have the last session be a reflection and review. So a total six Bible study sessions. And it's pretty much going to be every other Wednesday until uh, the end of March. So 
uh, I'll keep you updated and uh, we have a flyer out it's gonna start January 27th at 7 p.m. so please join us on zoom for that we also want to have a youth Bible study discussion that is going to be this week on Thursday uh, just really simple you know Bible study nothing uh, too serious. Uh, it's going to be Thursday, January 14th at 7 p.m. and I'll be writing an email to all of our um, parents for more information. So you just need to, your uh, kids 12 and up just need to sign on to Zoom and we're just going to have a Bible study discussion. And I also want to just get to know some of our youth because we haven't been meeting in per person. Um, I haven't been able to really meet and talk with our youth. So I thought it would be a great way to do that. So that'll be this Thursday at 7 p.m. That's it for now. Uh, I hope everyone has a good week. We ask that you continue to send in your offering to the church, either through PayPal or by writing a check. Our address is 1425 Keulu Drive, Kailua, Hawaii. And I just uh, want to thank all of you for faithfully sending in your offering each month, uh, weekly or quarterly, um, for believing in this ministry and for believing in what we are doing here at Keulu Mani United Methodist Church. We are dependent on your offerings. We wouldn't be able to do what we are called to do without it. So thank you for trusting us and for believing in what we're doing in this way. Thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>